in the last discussion I had with you, we yes. spoke about Daniel, Daniel Indeed. 7. So I'll just read that out for people who are, who are here. Who because haven't what, bothered watching the previous because, video. What have you been doing all because the Because there's Honestly. two things I want to establish with <laughs> this discussion with Josh is, one, the Jewish expectation of the Messiah, and two, did Jews actually believe that this, uh, the Messiah was divine? And three, did they believe in a suffering Messiah? So if we go to Daniel, we'll start on with the divinity aspect. Of course. Who so, saw the clouds of heaven? Which one do you want to start with today? We will start with the thrones. Yeah, he's back, isn't it? So, he's back. He's back. So, we'll go to Daniel, start with the thrones. Yeah, the thrones. That is... Verse 9. Verse 9. It Verse says eight. as follows, in Aramaic. Yep. ad v'chos v'on v'mev v'atik yom in Yosef. As I looked, thrones were placed, and an ancient of days did sit, whose uh, uh, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of whose head was like the pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels being burning fire. So, here we see, and I'll get the... Um Jewish. What is your understanding of this text? My understanding of this text is that one th it is that there are two thrones, right? One throne is the throne of righteousness, and one throne is something else which I forget. Okay, so basically, this text talks about someone with the Ancient of Days. So yes. I'll just start it again, read it again. So as I looked. Thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, and his clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was th fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out before him, and a thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Now what yes. I want to do, I want to go to the Chagiga. Yeah, Chagiga. Yes. And it says, you going to start with Abba Akiva, of course? Yes. Yes, of course. So now, it says... The Gemara poses another question. One verse states, his throne was fiery flames. And another phrase in the same verses state, till thrones were placed, and one who was the Ancient of Days sat, implying the existence of two thrones. The Gemara answers, this is not difficult. One throne is for him, and one is for David. As it is taught in the Baraita, with regard to this issue, yes. one throne for him and one for David. And this is the statement of Rabbi Akiva. Yes. Rabbi Yosei Hagagali yeah, said to him, how long shall you make the divine presence profane by presenting it as though one could sit next to him? Rather, the two thrones are designed for different purposes, one for judgment, and one for righteousness. Now, the reason why I read this is because he said one throne is for God and the other is for David. And another rabbi said, how can you, de uh, how can you profane the divine presence? Meaning, how can you attribute something human to what is of God? Now, this would be like a church father saying, Christ wasn't born of the virgin birth. It's a mistake that someone of that level does not make. So this is why when we look at the earliest Judaic text, the understanding that the Messiah, or there was a divine figure, someone could be divinized, this is like some of the very first evidence of it. And if you explain, and we'll go into Daniel further and explain why right. this would lead to a concept of a divine Messiah. Right, so in order to understand any piece of Gomorrah, you need to see it in its, in its Aramaic or Hebrew text, depending mm -hmm. on whether it's in Aramaic or Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Most of the Gemara is, of course, in Aramaic, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and you need to analyze, because the Gemara is not just telling you things randomly. Mm -hmm. The Gemara is here to teach you lessons, and it's here to show you intricate arguments between our sages of blessed memory. And in this case, between Abay Akiva and Abay Yosei Haglili, who were contemporaries. Mm -hmm. Um, Merkiva was one of the greatest sages that there were in the Tamayic period. 
Rabbi Yosef Lili is the only rabbi who ever won, a, who ever beat Rabbi Akiva in an argument in the Gemara. Okay, he's so, the only one. So the question and would it be twice: once here and once in Tractate. So the Kasachim. question would be: How so can someone is, so renowned make such yes, a mistake? So that's the question. So when we have a look at what the text says, mm. what is the 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 words that Rabbi Yosef Haklili uses when he accuses Rabbi Akiva of of doing such a terrible thing. So he says the Hebrew words are Ad Mosai Ato Ose Shchenocho Until when will you make the divine profane? Until when will you make the divine profane? Now the Gemara does not waste words. Usually the Gemara would say in such a thing that you're being Mechalel the Shechena or Mechalel Shem Shemayim. You are desecrating heaven or desecrating um, the divine. Here it uses a more roundabout way and he says until when will you make the divine profane? Why does he not say until when do you profane the divine? What's this business of making the divine profane? So the answer is because Abba Yosef Haglili who held Abba Akiva in such high esteem as we see from other statements he makes elsewhere obviously did not really believe Rabbi Akiva actually thought that God and the Messiah are on the same level. But, so, so, but so, 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 you're so, saying what he thought he believed, but I'm asking you, wait, what, why on, did wait, Akiva ah, say so that? So why did Rabbi That's Akiva the, say that? Yes. So to, go, to answer this question, we go to one of the classical commentaries on Agadic portions of G the Gemara, the Chidushe Agodus, written by the Maharshal who was a rabbi who lived, I believe, in the 16th century in Poland, or could be the 17th century, and his name was Rabbi um, Shlomo Edels, or Shmuel, Shmuel Edels. So he said he was Rabbi back then, 16th Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, known as the Maharsha. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote a very long commentary on this piece of Gemara, of which I printed out um, the relevant part. So does it give and Akiva's it does, opinion of why... And it gives his opinion. And it explains it, as follows. So is it Akiva's opinion of why give, he said it or yes, someone else's it, it opinion? Give, it gives Akiva's opinion as to why he said it. Sorry, let it me rephrase that. It Does explains it, Akiva's reasoning for saying what he said. Let me, let and me then it explains Yossi's uh, uh, reasoning for saying what he said and explains what's happening in the dialogue between them. So let but, me just make it clear. It gives Akiva's statement of why he said it or someone else's opinion of why they thought he said it. Oh no, th this is... Th th this. Okay. Whenever you learn Gemara, because of course mm. you're not familiar with this, the Gemara world mm. is a world that you are not familiar with and no one would expect you to be familiar with it. Mm. Um, because, as you may know, the majority of the Gemara mm -hmm. is very legal and we deal a lot with intricate arguments between rabbis. And the way you're supposed to study the Gemara yeah, but is... What, it, what I'm asking I'm, I'm, is what I'm, you're going to read. I'm answering your question. Okay. But you need an introduction before you can hear the answer, because otherwise you won't understand the answer. You, if, yep. it, it, the way you are, the way you study a Gemara is you analyze the intricate argument between the rabbis and try to work out why this rabbi said that and this rabbi said that, and what's the argument between them. So you, you're not going to provide me a statement of why he said it. You're going to provide something of why you think he might have said it. Because remember. If we're he made such a grave you, mistake going, in the I'm statement, going to explain to you we want to know why what, he said it, not what someone else We're going to explain thinks. to you what the Maharshal says is the reasoning of Abbe Akiva. And did he get that opinion from Akiva? or did no. he? So he we, worked it out. He, he worked, worked it, it out. out. Okay, give us the reasoning. They, we're trying to find mistake. out why did this person make a statement that divine divinizes this person, but I'm asking for a response from that person to say I said it because X, Y and Z not someone trying to then rectify it because even if we look in the Talmud they just said he's not an expert on Aki, um, Agatha yes right that was the so basically they're trying to say that well he's not an expert in this field so he that's his, his mistake but that still doesn't make the excuse of why he made well, that statement here's the explanation this is the explanation so, in order to understand this explanation, because this entire explanation is based on a single premise, mm -hmm. which is the premise known as Drush. Okay. Now, I've, I've talked about Drush um, with you before, um, and I've said that Drush is where you have extra letters or missing letters or extra words, missing words, repeated phrases, these kind of things, um, in the text of the Tanakh. 
the Hebrew Bible. Um, and we believe that God put those there for a reason, and he gave us certain rules in the oral law as to how to interpret them. Now, one, uh, now over here, this is what is in play. The Mahashal says as follows, that the, uh, uh, and, and he's basing it on the explanation of Rashi, uh, of this Gemara, which I would encourage you to, to look into it if you are interested. But basically, he says as follows. If you look at the words in the verse, can you open uh, the verses in Daniel? The word for throne, when you've got the Hebrew there. Daniel what? Uh, da this is Daniel chapter 7. Okay. It will take long, I'll just open it myself. I'll open it myself. Okay. What verse? Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. Let's get up the Hebrew. Yeah, no. It says in the Hebrew, which is really Aramaic, but whatever. It says, the, uh, so, in the, so in the first time that it says the word throne, in the first time that it has the word for throne, here we are. It spells it, Kof Reish Samach Vov Nun. The second time, it's. It's the same Hebrew as this one. Yeah. yeah. So the, why did you say, why did you say, for say, and then the. Yeah. So, 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 so that is that is the uh, that's okay. the singular without any possessive suffixes. So the point um, is. So I'm honestly. This is singular. This is you're not talking about started. this. <laughs> the first one, kaf reish samech vav nun, okay, which is of course the plural thrones, mm -hmm. okay, has an it has a strange way of showing the plural. The usual way of showing the plural would just to be what well, would be to put in yud nun, not vav nun. So why did they put in a vav nun? This is, seems to be a grammatical inaccuracy. The second thing we need to ask... <laughs> it's a grammatical <laughs> inaccuracy in the, in the Torah. I said seems to be a grammatical inaccuracy. That's God make mean? mistakes. No. The prophets make mistakes. No. Okay, all right. Just so we establish that. As I already said, these okay. are put in on purpose. I'm going to explain them. Okay. Okay? Mm. You, you seem to be jumping the gun. No, I'm just getting clarification for people who may not understand who what may not have, about. Who may not have bothered listening to what I said two minutes ago. You have very little faith in the viewer. Um, the second time it says it, it says the word kosiyeh, okay, kof reish samach yud hey, and here we have the expected, uh, the expected grammatical form of the word, without any extra letters, um, without any um, differences in the lettering that we would have expected from a grammatical point of view. So, we have two different opinions in our tradition as to what hap as to what is the reason for this strange vovnun suffix that we find in the first in the first words there. And this appears two other places in Tanakh. Um, the most notable is on the word Shabbaton, which is talking about the laws of the Day of Atonement in Leviticus. Okay, and, so... And over there we also have this strange additional vovnun at the end of a word that seems to be out of place. So over there, um, there's an argument about what exactly the vovnun is doing. Rabbi Akiva holds of one opinion, and Rabbi Yossi Haglili holds of the other opinion. So, so, now, okay. Rabbi Akiva holds, and this is what the Maharshal says, mm -hmm. that the extra nun, the extra vav nun in the word Kosovan yeah. is Bore al Horabin. This teaches on the many. So basically, okay. you're saying is a possible misreading of the text or misinterpretation of the text. What's a possible misinterpretation of the text? So you're saying there's two different. There's two different ways of, 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 understanding. of, of understanding it. Yes. Abba Akiva and Abba Yosef Haglili, yes. they agree on the point that this needs to be, it, this, this inaccuracy, this grammatical inaccuracy, needs to be explained using a drush. And they, it's, and they agree that it's, uh, that, that it's going to be something which is about comparative being, but this, about comparing, it's, this is a very complicated point. But this, this is very the, nuanced. But this is the issue. This is not if, the usual way of... But this is the issue. If there are two different possible ways of taking it yes as someone who is such an expertise within his field he should know he should not be able to accept the incorrect reading of the because text. they're not neither of them incorrect that's the point hold on so Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi, 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 okay the problem is that the way Rabbi Akiva mm. uses this drush which is Moa al Harabim, it teaches about the many okay mm -hmm. and it, it basically means that the two the two. Um, so the issue the, is sorry, why are there sorry, more no, than? So the, no, basically, no, no, for the, no, no, let me just explain. So the issue is why is there a plurality of thrones? 
Yes. Right. Okay. So now so, that's what has caused an issue. So they're wondering. So, so you're I've read, saying. I've read this wrong, sorry. It says it's Mara al Hakatnos. It teaches okay. about the smallness. Ah, this is, this is the clip. Okay. Mm. So Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Yossi mm. ha- are really arguing about whether or not this Vav Nun, mm-hmm. which is added, yeah. is there to tell you that one throat is smaller than the other or are the throats the same size? Mm-hmm. Okay? This is, th- th- this is really the argument. Now, according to Rabbi Akiva's opinion, that this Vav Nun means that what this throne is smaller than the other throne, then according to him, there's no profanity being made here. Because you have David's throne, which is smaller than God's throne. But according to Rabbi Yossi's opinion, that the Vav Nun comes to teach you... But that uh, still can, doesn't comes make to teach sense. You the, because even uh, if... Uh, can we finish the sentence? According to Rabbi Yossi, who does not hold that, okay, these thrones are the same size, okay, so, according to Rabbi Akiva's opinion, okay, when you look at Rabbi Akiva. Now, if you were to put Rabbi Yossi into Rabbi Akiva's opinion, okay, so then Rabbi Akiva does not see any profanities in Rabbi Yossi. So you're si- but when you put Rabbi Yossi in Rabbi Akiva, uh, when you put Rabbi Akiva in Rabbi Yossi's opinion, Rabbi Yossi sees a profanity. Now, Rabbi Yossi does not think Rabbi Akiva is actually profaning God. What does he say? He says, people, like Paperboy here, are going to look at the, at the Talmud and come with the wrong conclusion. They're going to see Rabbi Akiva and say, and, and say, oh, he is doing something which, according to the, which, which according to, to, to to our understanding of the Messiah, is something which is profane. So basically, and therefore he says, at Mosai at Until when are you making the divine profane? Not not until when you're profaning the divine. No, heaven forbid, Rabbi Akiva was not profaning the divine. Rabbi Yossi never suggested such a thing. He's making it. Is and it, making and it, it seem as if he is making the the, the divine profane, and that is exactly what Paperboy. So, so, so this is what my is, entire, and his misunderstanding has come and this is from what, not understanding how to learn a piece of Gemara and, because he has not been taught. And this is what my point so. is: Rabbi Akiva lived in the second century. This is after Christ, because Christians are obviously claiming Christ to be divine. So the later rabbi has to then admonish Akiva for they're giving. They're not later; they're in the same generation. Yeah, are, but I, are, when, no, no, when I say later, as in he's made the statement and he's later corrected him, as in that's what I mean by later. Oh, so right. the next line of the, of the well, that wouldn't have been historically the next line. No, it would. So it would have been, w- it would have been a space of, yeah, two. space of time. So he said some, a statement and, and then, then he, someone's responded. Yes. So my point is this, because if they do not make that a heretical view, it gives legitimacy to the Christians to then claim that Jesus a throne is for David or a human can sit on a throne that is associated for God so then what he said is no one is one of the thrones is for his footstool so the both thrones are for God but both one is his footstool one is his throne whereas the other person said no one is for God one is for David who who they kind of sometimes call the Messiah so that's why you're profaning a uh, something attributed to God. Why does he say you're making the divine profane instead of you're profaning God? Because he, you're not actually profaning God, you're making it look... Okay? So you're ele- you're, exactly, you're, you're, you're make, elevating you're make, you're, a human to the same no, status you're ma- of you're God. Make, you're making people who are not learned, who look at this, and will say mm-hmm. you are pro- th- 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 that here is a profaning of God. Not that you are profaning God, because, but because according to Rabbi Akiva's opinion, there's no profaning of God. But, We've got David's throne, which is smaller you, than God's but throne. But you just said it would give people a like paperboy an excuse to to do what to say that the messiah was divine thank you very much that was my point now let's continue with to daniel 14. but couldn't, couldn't the thrones be used as a, like as like how you'd say the the the, the we like the, yeah. the royal we no that that that's it's yeah, that based on it's based on the grammar so mm-hmm. it's not nothing to do with that and there was no except no uh, Jewish, there was no Jewish understanding of plural of majesty. We can look in the text. There's no, yeah, I know, such, but he's, there's he's no such thing in Judaism. So, so that that was my very point. Now we'll go on to Daniel seven fourteen. Because ah yes, because you still have failed to yes. give a reason why the attendants didn't mention the clouds. Now we, we'll go through seven fourteen. It's yes. jumping on in Daniel, and it says. I saw in the night visions, and Maybe behold... Before, before you do, before you do, I'm just going to recap for the viewer who may not have remembered or seen the previous video. Mm. But in the previous video, we looked at 7.14, and we yeah. saw also in the attendant explanation of 7.14. Yeah. And Paperboy gets very hung up about the, the clouds of... Uh, that, that this... Son of this man. Son, one like a son of man comes 
um, in which it comes heaven. in the clouds of heaven. He gets very hung up about that, mm. and he says, "Oh, look, it must be divine. It must be the Messiah. It must be Jesus." Yes. Right. And not, I was saying, Jesus. Uh, don't say just say the, uh, like a right. divine person. And I yes. was saying uh, because you say that it's 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 a divine figure, yes. and it's the divine figure which is the, you believe is the Messiah, yes. who you believe is Jesus. Yes. Okay. Now, when you look at how the attendant explains it, how does he explain it? Yes. He explains yes. um, that. Uh, the, no, no, hold on, because in this verse 7, 14, so I read it, it says we... that splen splendor, kingship and grandeur, these kind of things, mm -hmm. were, give, um, uh, were given to this one like son of man who came with the clouds of heaven. Yeah. The attendant explains who was uh, kingship, splendor, grand grandeur given to. It was given to the holy ones of the Most High, okay. which is, of course, the Jewish people. Right. Now, over there, he makes no mention of the clouds of heaven. Yeah. You can only assume the clouds of heaven must be a metaphor, just like the fact that the animals who came from the beasts who came from the, down uh, up from the sea at the beginning of the chapter are, are, are actually talking about kingdoms who did not actually literally come from the sea and are not literally animals. Okay. So now, when I first read this verse to you, and it says one like the Son of Man, you said it was must be someone who's not human that looks like a human. Now you're saying it's the nation of Israel or the. Or it's I retracted rep it's 30 seconds after so, you said that so image. Let, let me just correct. You know it. let, two, let, two let me just get ago. your confirmation. So now you're saying this one like the Son of Man is not a person. Is that correct? The one like a Son of Man yes. is the nation of Israel. Is, okay. That now, is exactly what now the I'm going says. to read it. That, it's not what I'm wait, saying. It's what they're telling me. Okay. Forget about me. Let, forget, wait, let me read look, the passage. Look, look, Josh, oh, calm hold, down. Hold, calm down. Okay, the attendant. Forget about me. Forget about me. Josh is saying the attendant. This is about what God thinks. This is about what God thinks. All right. And God. God gave Daniel prophecy mm. and Daniel accepted what the attendant said. Okay. okay? So this I'm, is very important. I'm going to read it. So it says, I saw in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the son of man and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And then we go on because it's quite a long passage where the att attendant describes what each of the four beasts are. And then we get to 27, 26, it says, but the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom of, and the dominion and the greatness of the heavens under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So based on this, Josh is saying the attendant ex is explaining the son of man as the nation of Israel. But we have a problem because when we go to Sanhedrin 98a, it says, Rabbi Alexandri says Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi raises a contradiction between two depictions of the coming Messiah. It is written, there came with the clouds of heaven, one like unto a son of man. And there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom and his dominion is an everlasting dominion and it is written behold your king will come to you just as as he is just and victorious lowly and riding upon a donkey upon a colt and the foal of a donkey Zachariah 9 9 yes. so now if read that the is, answer read the answer read the answer Rabbi Alexandria explains if the Jewish people merit redemption the Messiah will come in a mir miraculous manner with the clouds of heaven if they do not merit redemption, the Messiah will come lowly on a now, if you look a, in the Hebrew, Wait, let me just finish my point. Okay, okay. He said Daniel 7.14 is the nation of Israel. So how can it then be a contradiction between whether he comes with the clouds or uh, on a donkey? Because it must be the nation of Israel is coming on the clouds because that he just said Daniel 7.14 is about the nation of Israel. So then how do we get the Messiah? From the nation of I Israel. I am so glad you are. Okay. <laughs> Go on, Josh. So in so in the Hebrew, if mm. you look there, yes. it does not nowhere does it say mm. that Rabbi Alexandri, in the name of Rabbi Yehoshua, actually thinks that the person who came with the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven is the Messiah. However, but, but, and how do I know that? Because when you look so in the again. Hebrew, because mm -hmm. when you look in the Hebrew, mm -hmm. what does it say in the answer? It says, um, one second. What does that mean? If they merit, if they merit, mm -hmm. okay, yes. then. Th th so th if th they th merit th redemption, th Israel is th going th to come and redeem themselves. It, no. 
You know, pin you down and what you no, say. No, no, let him finish. <laughs> All right. Honestly, okay, you're, making, you're making yourself look bad. All right, yeah, finish. Yeah, <laughs> Stop it. Honestly. Right. Now. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. You're, you're, all, you're all viling up. Okay, mm. so. He said, the answer says, Zohu. If they have merited, okay, then he'll come on. He'll come as a poor man on the donkey. Mm. Lo Zohu, if they've not merited, then im Okay, what does this mean? No mention is made of the Messiah in the actual Hebrew text. The translation has very... The, the tra there's no mention of the Messiah in the Hebrew text. The look, in the he look, yeah. in, look in the Hebrew text. Look in, in all of the whole Hebrew text, the Messiah to come is not mentioned as the Messiah. It's interpreted no, no, as the Messiah. I'm talking about in that Gemara over there. Okay. The, the Gemara you just quoted. Okay. okay. No yeah, one mentions yeah. the Messiah. Okay. This is a translation that you put. Really, it's talking about the redemption. Okay. The redemption. How is the redemption to come? On the one hand, we see in Zechariah that the Messiah, who is the Redeemer, who's to bring the redemption, is going to come as a as a pauper on a donkey. But in Daniel, we see that the redemption of the Jewish people is going to come. Uh, is 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 described as coming with the clouds of heaven. Right? Because the Jewish people is the one like a son of man. And over there, it's talking about just our, it, when the fourth beast is destroyed, the fourth beast being the last of the exiles, which um, could be Rome, right? Um, which, of course, is, is really metaphorical for the whole, um, the whole Edomite society of the of what ends up kind of Western culture that we have today. Um, that it has, I've lost my strength train of thought. What was, what was You're saying? explaining oh, yes. the so, interpretation yes. of so how it, the Messiah uh, will come. So, so, so we see that the, this is talking about the redemption of the Jewish people because it's after the destruction of the fourth beast. The redemption of the Jewish people happens to be the Messianic age and the Messiah is the one who's going to herald it. How is this redemption, redemption going to come about? Is this redemption going to be something which, 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 is, which is the Messiah coming as a pauper on a donkey? Or is, the, or is this redemption going to come as come look like the Jewish people, the nation is going to be coming on the clouds of heaven? What's this redemption going to be like? This seems to be a contradiction, says Rabbi Alexandria in the name of Rabbi Yeshua. And so he answers, and so he answers, if they, the Jewish people, have merited, then redemption will come in the form of the Messiah on a, 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 as a pauper on a donkey. But if they have not merited, then redemption will come in the form of coming on the clouds of heaven. So now, this is from Safari, which is a Jewish... Everything here is non-Christian. And it, again, it says, Levi raises a contradiction between two depictions of the coming of the Messiah. You said it wasn't in the Hebrew. This is not a Christian interpretation. No, I, so I, I'm un asking you, why no. would your fellow Jews... And let me no. just actually when, show... When, when, when I learn a Gemara, yeah. I don't care about somebody else's translation. Okay. I learn a Gemara, I read the text, All right. and, then I, and, and then I explain it based on what the text says. Okay. That's what a, stu a true student of the Gemara does. That's why, if you, if you look in a, any of the Talmudic academies you have today in yeshivas, nobody learns... Okay, people well, do not clearly... learn from, for example, an art school. Why? Because the art school will give you, will, will, will give you some sort of interpretation, and you haven't worked it out yourself. Who's the Gemara you're supposed to work William it out Davidson yourself. William Davidson Talmud. I don't know who William Davidson is. Okay. I've never heard of him. Oh, right. It's not a Talmud that uh, well, it's just I've a translation. heard of. The only Talmuds that I've ever heard of in terms of translations mm -hmm. are the Art School, the oh, Steinsaltz, the, the um, uh, what's the what's the old one? The, no, the, the Sonsino. Well, the I'm one. just showing you clearly right. we see here that Sanhedrin lights. And this I is don't, a I don't, text, so. I don't know who William Davidson is. He doesn't yeah. sound Jewish. I don't okay. know who he is. So, but this is the thing. Maybe you should look it up. Well, this is the thing. Do you want to look if it up? Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi raises two points, one about the Messiah coming on the on a donkey, the yes. other point has to refer to the Messiah as well. That's Not why necessarily. So you're, if he's talking about the, it, that, that would only be okay. if the topic of discussion is the Messiah. If the topic of discussion is about, <laughs> about uh, it, it, look, if the, look, I'm, what I'm doing is. The way I'm interpreting is I'm triangulating. I'm looking at the answer and yes. using the answer to explain the question. The answer says yes. uh, it's talking all about the Jewish people meriting redemption. Okay, read, okay, read the Hebrew meriting. word for word. Okay. Omar of the Alexandri of Yeshua ben Levi. Yes. The Alexandri says in the name of Yeshua ben Levi. Ksiv, it is written, the Aru im Anonay Shomaya Kva Enosh. 
and came with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man. Ato, you. Uxiv, Oni, Verochiv, sorry, also, he came, right. Uxiv, and it's written, Oni, Verochiv, Al Khamur, a pauper and riding on a donkey. Zochu, Im Anane Shemaya, if they've merited with the clouds of heaven, Lo Zochu, if they've not merited, Oni, Verochiv, Al Khamur. And he's a pauper riding on a donkey. Right, so now what I'm trying to highlight is that even if Josh is going through the strict Hebrew, the, vo the context of the, what is being discussed is very clear. The Messiah is going to come on a donkey for one reason. Then he's saying, well, it doesn't say specifically Messiah relating to the clouds of heaven. Obviously, clearly what is being weighed up is how the Messiah is going to arrive, even if it doesn't say specifically in the text the word Messiah. But you're trying to say, well, because it doesn't say the word Messiah, one is about him coming on the donkey, if we deserve whatever, and him and something else, given a totally different contextual understanding say, to... If we talk about the Messiah as a redeeming figure, and we talk about this whole thing here that he's talking about in the contradiction in, in the nature of the redemption of Israel, yes. then it does, then it works perfectly well according to my understanding. I understand where you're coming from. Yes. I, I totally understand where you're coming from. But you have to accept that my interpretation is, is at least just as yeah, good. Because what I'm saying is, if we go by Daniel 7, 14, if it's the nation of Israel, Comparing the nation of Israel to how the Messiah is going to come on a donkey does not make sense. It only makes sense if you understood this as a messianic verse and you're comparing, it's well, it's saying he's coming in. Verse. It's not the same as a verse about the Messiah. A, a verse about how the Messiah is going to come. Or, alternatively, a verse about how the redemption is to unfold. And the, who comes in the redemption? The, the Messiah. Messiah. Exactly. Yes. So they're both about the Messiah. Because how he arrives is based on the redemption in your so, so if you are good, he will come in one way. If you are bad, he will come in another way. So it both points to the Messiah and his coming. Well, okay, explain in your understanding how it makes sense. As I've already explained. Okay? Because I'm sure the viewer has already understood the point I'm making. I, I believe you're actually trying to deliberately misunderstand, deliberately not understand, you're not misunderstood what I'm saying, you just seem to be deliberately trying to act as if I'm saying it's ridiculous. It doesn't make, it's not consistent you're being, you're being, what I'm saying. You're being, as they say, obtuse. Um, no. But because you understand perfectly well what I'm yes. saying, it's perfectly clear. Um, what I said was that you could understand this as talking contextually about the Messiah and that both sides, okay, the donkey and the clouds of heaven, it's both talking about the Messiah, okay, and that's what the context is. Alternatively, you could look at, okay, and I, I look at these as Messiah verses, verses yes. about the Messiah, and that's what you want to do. I would say, there's but another just, way of doing it. Let me just pause There's another way of doing it. There's another way of doing it, which is, that you look on, that, 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 that you look at both of them as talking about messianic or, 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 or verses, also known as redemption verses, verses about redemption of Israel. Right. Because in Jewish theology, the Messiah is to be the redeemer of Israel. Yes. So, again, but if you're saying they're both about the redemption, and saying not about the redeemer, yes, both about the redemption. But the problem is, one of them talks about the redeemer and the redemption and then you're saying the other no, one that's because not true one of them talks about the only donkey. the redeemer and the other one talks about only the redemption okay but that's what i'm saying that is your but the you, redeemer is a major part yes. of the redemption but what i'm trying to now say people can decide for themselves yes. that josh's view is that one talks about the redeemer and the other verse talks about the redemption and I've also read from this Jewish text, the Sanhedrin 98A, where they put it talk, the rabbi is talking about a contradiction in how the Messiah is arriving. Because when I started this, and we were talking about Islam, what did I say to you? I will appeal to your Jewish text and show that there is a consistency or at least a basis for the Christian belief within Juda Judaism's thought. So that's why I said, like with Islam, there are stories that you don't seem to be aware of. For example, Moses being chased by a stone. But I'm saying, when Jesus says, I am the son of man, and you'll see me coming in the, rock, uh, coming in the clouds day, of heaven, the these are things taken from the Old Testament. Now, we're also seeing that there can be, let's just for argument's sake, 
that there is a possibility that some interpreted it as a messianic type verse or about how the Messiah is going to come. So when we look at our Christian theology and we go back into some of even... Right. Oh, I haven't changed my clock. Okay. 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 No, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we won't be too long. So right. that, that is what my argument is, that these concepts that we have not draw from Christianity can actually be traced back to some of the things that rabbis have said. Whether you agree with the consensus or not, it shows that these are not just picked out of the air, that at least taken from the text, whereas within Islam, these are things that, even with, for example, Deuteronomy 1818, there's no rabbi that would have said this, yeah. could possibly be talking about someone who's not an Israelite. Yeah. Well, at least with us, That's we are true. saying That's there true. are some arguments that where people yeah. have... Uh, no, 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 I think look at it as true, is, 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 is due. Mm. You're making original arguments, you're trying to be clever about it, okay? Thank you. Um, unlike the Muslims where... Inter look, look, you're, not, you're not dealing with the usual stuff, you're not dealing with the usual... No. Twisting of Sorry, oh, the, meaning. Yeah, the usual twisting like Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah 53. Yeah. You're not dealing with those kind of things. Psalms 22, 110, yeah. etc. Yeah. Right? It, uh, and you're not dealing with Muslim twist. <laughs> okay, because of course Christians and Muslims have been the same twistings for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm. Right? Like one of these talks about the, 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 the Muslims that do about it on the 18th in his, in his letter to the Yemenite Jews, the Agaris Tamon. Okay, he already talks about some of the Muslim claims back then. The Ibn Ezra and Abba Benel and many others talk about Christian interpretations of Isaiah 53 and whatever all the way back then. Those are not you. I need to give you credit where credit is due that you are bringing new arguments to the table that is making people have to think more. Well, um, now this not, is. Not that we don't have answers to them. Well, I see, I do have answers. Well, this is a thing because you just touch upon. You should step to the door in the morning. So, uh, so, 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 yes. So, yes. Credit where credit is due. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You stop the car. Yeah, but sorry, I'm about to ask. No, no, no. <laughs> Do you know when it stops? No, no, no. Don't worry. Don't worry. We've got the budget. It's been the whole time. Yeah, let um thing, and then we'll just. Hold on, hold on. We've all we've got your hoodies to rely on. Okay. Just an un uncut version. Because, because your hoodies gonna put it all on anyway. What what channel? Yeah. yeah. I have to make one. Okay. Well, let, let me know. Maybe, maybe, no, no. I think we'll okay. make a, a new yeah, Jewish yeah. Speakers no, Corner yeah. channel. I think okay. that's a good idea. So. Must be a few minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Two minutes. A new Jewish yeah, we don't know how long it stops for. Really, two minutes. I like, repeat it. Yeah. That's what you Okay. We'll so. make a Jewish Speakers Corner channel. We'll put it up and we'll send you the thing. All right? 20, 30 minutes. This gentleman been... This gentleman been... Okay. Okay. So... You also, so what I also wanted to question you on is. Um, uh, I, think, I think it's about the prophethood of Muhammad. And what's the day? Another Gemara? 9 6. Oh, yeah! I was doing this on Sabbath. I was, okay. I was going over it just so, in case. So oh, we'll, I'm so glad. We, we Are you going to do the argument from the cancellation? From the what? From the cancellation bit. You're going to do that argument or What's a different the cancellation? one? cancellation? Right, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you okay. because I can't be okay, bothered to deal with that. Okay, okay. I, I, let I, it come I, to press this one here. Right. So, <laughs> go on the virgin bit. The virgin the there, that's so. 7.14. He's doing 9. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. Or shall we do... We'll be done, Isaac. You've done 53. You, you, it, it's, it's, it's finished. Um, people of Israel, obviously. Okay. And yeah. also one other point I wanted to highlight before we go into some of the meat of the text. <laughs> because... We've discussed the timeline of when Christ was supposed to come the first time oh, round. We're going to do and the 70 weeks now. Huh? You want to do the 70 weeks? No, yeah, well, go, I just go. wanted to highlight because I said, I'll show you I, this I'm ready before. For, I'm ready. Because he said that the, all Jews now believe, have to believe in being repentant and doing good, and then yeah, yeah. at some point the Messiah will come. And I yeah. said, no, the, there was a specific time point that the oh, Messiah the was supposed to come, yeah, and all the dates. Like within Jewish text, it says the dates have passed. Yeah. Now, also, I wanted to I just show that in a previous video, if you remember. Just for our Christian audience, now in Yoma 39b, it says the sages taught during ah, the tenure yeah, of yeah. Shimon has has how do you say it has attacked. Sorry. Oh, Shimon Hatzadik, Shimon the righteous. The lot Simon for the God always arose in the high priest's right hand after his death. It occurred only occasionally. But during the 40 years prior to the destruction of the second temple, ah, the lot yes, for God did not arise in the high priest's right hand at all. 
So basically, this destruction of the temple was 70 AD, 40 years before it takes us to 30 AD. Yeah. So what this text is showing us within the Jewish Talmud is that God stopped accepting the sacrifices from the Israelites for, from their side for some unapparent reason, they don't know why. From a Christian perspective, I will say it seems to be a coincidence that 40 years before was the crucifixion of Christ and from that time God stopped accepting sacrifices within the temple. So let's first have a look at what Rashi says. Okay, let's go back to the text. All right, so if you click on the thing, uh, is, it, is this the Safari website? Yeah, oh. this is the screen. Oh, you're not on the Safari website. I can't go on the commentaries. No, I need uh, to go online for that. Oh, all right. Can okay. Do that? Uh, I have to go from, from my phone because this one, you have to go through the internet. You don't, so you want, you want to look at the interpretation? I want to look at the commentary of Rashi because that's usually my first port of call. I have seen this come before in the context of Christians. And no prophets since then. But I do like to see Rashi. Uh, yeah, no, no before well, well. Co coincidentally, well, no more pro prophet since Malachi. Yeah, exactly, before that. Malachi. So, and then I just wanted to show, highlight to Christian, I mean, the audience as well. As I said, I always, I'll use the yeah. Jewish text, and I'm not twisting them, but they've said themselves 40 years before the destruction yeah. of the temple, I mean, of course, sacrifices of seem to stop. And it seems to coincide. Jesus got to do with 40 and it, years before the temple? Because it seems to coincide coincide with the time frame that was established for the Messiah to yeah. come because remember my point was this they said all the allotted times have passed so for the allotted times have passed that means there had to be a certain time frame then when they believe he didn't come then they say now we're just waiting in expectation because there was it is it wasn't an understanding of well he's going to come at any point it was he should come around this time but now the Jewish interpretation is, well, he hasn't come, so we don't know when he's coming. But what Christians are saying is that actually there was a Messiah who came during that allotted time, but you guys do not accept him. So now, let me just find this thing for you. Not a Messiah, the Messiah. Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. We'll get into that as well, <laughs> if we have time. I like time. you. You're a, you're a character. What's your name? I can't tell you my name for security reasons. Because... Fair enough. We'll call him Fred. For security Fred. reasons. We'll call him Fred. But we'll... we'll Fred. For, for time reasons, let's go into something else. All right. Uh, look, because look, look I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what what I think is probably going on here. Because I know that the... the the In the years coming up to the destruction of the Second Temple, which mm. of course was destroyed because of sins of the Jewish people. What were the sins? Okay. Um, mainly it was because of baseless hatred between Jews. Sinas Chinon. Um, that was the main reason why the Second Temple was, des was destroyed. Um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the Second Temple was destroyed mainly because of baseless hatred, as we say, between Jews. Between, between Jews, just like all what Jews. kind of hatred? I don't know what type of hatred, just hatred. Okay. Right? People were not not loving their fellow Jew, um, and uh, uh, which is a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it could very well be that that the sins of the Jewish people had intensified so much in the 40 years prior to the destruction of the Second Temple that, the, uh, that, 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 the, that, that God simply would not, atone, would not bring atonement for them anymore. Um, using the... the, uh, the, uh, uh, the he would not, no longer accept the Day of Atonement service anymore. That mm. could very well be the case. And it, obviously the Christian argument is it seems to be very coincidental that we say Christ was wounded for our transgressions and crucified for our sins, that that occurrence happened just coincidentally 40 years before the, uh, the, the temple was destroyed and coincidentally around the same time when God decides stopped accepting sacrifices when we, around the same time when we say Christ offered himself as a sacrifice, which was the final atonement. 
for mankind. Oh, by the way, I should point your attention, uh, Ali Dawa, in case you, you uh, want to bring him in because of you were so interested in him earlier. He's over, over there. there. That's fine. We'll talk later because now going on to the crucifixion, we're going to Isaiah 53. Yay! Because so much. now what we want to build up is an understanding of where did this uh, um, concept of Christians accepting this as Jesus, a prophecy about Jesus come from. Oh, because yes. I asked you earlier on, I'd just like to confirm, who was Jonathan Ben Uziel? Jonathan Ben Uziel was a student of, Zach of Zachariah, Haggai and Malachi. So he was apparently a disciple of three prophets. Yes. Now, he lived in, the Targum was written in what, which century? Well, the Targum of him yeah. was written by him. Okay, so, so that was like early first century the, BC. This this was during the time when the, the second temple had just been built. I don't know what century that is. Okay, but so before Christianity. And oh yeah, a long time before Okay, that. so now... We're going to deal with him and you're going to... Josh has confirmed that the Targum was written by Jonathan Ben Uziel, yes. who was a disciple of not one, three not two, prophets. but three prophets. Okay. Now, when we go to his Targum, don't worry, we're going to put it on the screen. Yeah. Take Isaiah one 53. Verse out of the entire screen, Targum. No, we'll start from verse one, right. and we'll and I'll explain it oh, to wait, you. So, you're not, wait, you're not doing. 52, 13? You're doing 53? Yeah, I'll start I'm, from one. I am very surprised. I'm starting from one. <laughs> I'm really Sorry, Why, why, why? why? Yes. Because usually the thing is to take from 52, 13 yeah, and, but just, we, to, uh, and, and just, to, just to do that because he says the servant's the Messiah yeah, but let, and then let, to build a thing up now, about let's, without looking at the rest. But I'm now, surprised. That's fine because it still helps our position. Yeah, sure. So it says, Who have believed in our report and whom is now the power of the arm of the Lord revealed? The righteous shall be great before him. Behold, like branches that bud and like a tree which sends forth its roots by the streams of water. Thus, but thus shall the generation of the just multiply in the land which hath That's need not what it says. of him. That's or you can correct it. This is a translation, so maybe your translation is different, but we'll get to that anyway. So it says his visage is not... Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is translated directly from the Aramaic. Guys, yeah, that's fine. You, anything you disagree with, then we can go back to it. All right. So it says, His visage shall not be the visage of a common person, neither his fear of a pleblin. Pleblin? Well, <laughs> plebeian. anyone know what a plebeian is? I think it's like a... Pleb. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, is that where the word pleb comes from? Common man. But well, even I'm learning something now. Yeah, oh, so, so then it says, Speakers But a holy corner, brightness even, even, shall be his brightness, that <laughs> everyone who words. sees him shall contemplate him. Although he shall be in contempt, yet he shall cut off the glory of all the wicked. They shall be weak and wretched. Lo, we are in contempt and not redeemed. That's verse 4. As a man of pain and appointed to sickness, as if he had removed the face of his Shekinah from us. Therefore, he shall pray for our sins and our iniquities for his sake shall be forgiven us. For we are considered crushed, smitten of the Lord and afflicted. He shall build the house of the sanctuary, which has been profaned on the account of our sins. He was delivered over on account of our iniquities and through his doctrine, peace shall be multiplied upon us and though the teaching of his words and through the teaching of his words our sin shall be forgiven us like all we like sheep have been scattered every one of us has turned to his own way it pleased the lord to forgive the sins of all of us for his sake he shall pray no it's in the past tense he shall pray no. and shall be our, well, anything just correct me afterwards you can read your version he shall pray and shall be answered Yea, before he shall open his mouth, he shall be heard. He shall deliver over the mighty of the nations as a lamb to the slaughter, and like a lamb to the slaughter. Eight, nine. Like, like sheep before her shearers is dumb, none shall in his presence open his mouth or speak a word. He shall gather our captives from affliction and pain, and who shall be able to narrate the wonderful works which shall be done for us? In his days shall he remove the rule of the nations from the land of Israel the sins of which my people have committed and have upon them and he shall deliver the wicked into hell and the riches of the treasures which they got by violence unto the death of Abaddon that they who 
that they who commit sin shall not remain and that they should not speak folly with their mouth and it was the pleasure of the Lord to refine and to purify the remnant of his people in order to cleanse their souls from sin that they might see the kingdom of their Messiah that their sons and daughters might multiply and prolong their days and those that keep I stopped at 13 read the end of the verse don't stop at the middle of a verse. <laughs> oh, because it's numbered differently. So, okay, I'll go to 12. And he those, shall deliver their souls no, no, from... No, 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 you, you missed something. Yeah. And so, for longer days, and those that keep the law of the Lord shall for those pleasure. pleasure. You okay. stopped before right. that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and yeah, that the Messiah, that their sons and daughters might multiply and prolong their days, and those that keep the law of their Lord shall prosper through his pleasure. Yes. Now, the reason why I wanted to draw our attention to this is because Christians always claim this is about the Messiah. Now, Josh has confirmed that this is in a text that came before the Christianity yeah, and yeah. the person mentioned the Messiah in it, therefore indicating it is a messianic verse. Now, if this person was taught by not one, but two, not two, but three prophets, how did his interpretation of this verse, because Josh is going to tell me this is about the nation of Israel, yeah, yeah. but I'm going to ask him, anyone who came with a different interpretation, were these people taught by a prophet, according to him? So why is their understanding superseding this person who was taught by not one, not two, but three prophets? And he mentioned the Messiah before Christianity. Guys, the pub well, are going to close soon, so just bear that in mind. Okay. It's quite clear from these verses of mm. Yonasan Benazil, his, his Targum here, mm. the explanation of the verses, that the sufferer is the people of Israel, but the servant is the Messiah. He seems to be drawing a very clear distinction between the two. And you can see that throughout here. So can the nation of Israel suffer for its own sins? Obviously. But the person came to redeem Israel from their sins. So if yeah. Israel is the sinner, they cannot redeem themselves from their own sins. They're not redeeming themselves from their own sins. Mm. The Redeemer, the Messiah, is coming. Look, the Targum is not, is not translating literally the verses, obviously. Yes. Okay? Now, in the verses, we don't see any distinction between the servant of God and the one who, is, who, is, who has suffered. Okay? Mm -hmm. and the Targum draws a distinction between those two. Yes. And the servant ends up being the Messiah. And the one who has suffered is, is the people of Israel. So the one who has suffered is who? Is the people of Israel. So, okay. And, now, he's, and he already starts so who, that who bears in 5214. As the house of, okay, where he says, um, as the house of Israel looked mm. to him during many days, because their countenance was darkened among the peoples, and their complexion beyond the sons of men. And that's how it continues from there. So so who was, who received the, the trans the iniquity who was received cut the iniquity which verse is that just remind me because um, it yeah. says he was cut from the land of the living yeah here it is verse is that verse 10 which verse is that verse 9 um, where's land of the living so when it says who received the iniquity of the is that lord verse 6 or verse 4 which verse are you? So when when it so if we go into three, for verse example, three. Okay. So verse three says. Or four. Okay. Verse three in the Targum. Then he will become despised, mm -hmm. and will cut off the glory of all the kingdoms. Mm -hmm. They will be pros they will be prostrate at morning, yep. like a man of pains and like one destined for sicknesses, and as though the presence of the Shechina has been withdrawn from us. They yep. will be despised and esteemed not. Yeah, carry on. Then for our sins he will pray, and our iniquities will for his sake be forgiven, although we were accounted stricken, smitten from before the Lord, and afflicted. And next one. But he will build up the holy place which has been polluted for our sins and delivered <coughs> to the enemy for our iniquities. And by his instruction, peace shall be increased upon us. And by devotion to his words, our sins will be forgiven. Okay, so let me... C could you just... Hold on a second. I just need to have a look at 52.15. You might have to move it that way to the part sure closing. It's closing. 52.15. Okay. Oh! 
So, shall I read it oh, in? Oh, here we are. Hold on a second. Do you want to read Hold it from on. your Tanakh as well? So we get the, we can compare the two. Oh, I actually the have the comparison. comparison. I have okay. one after the other. The verse from the Tanakh, followed by the verse in the Torah. Okay, where's verse 4? So verse 4 is over here. That's the Isaiah, Okay, yeah, read, read verse 5. Verse 5 in the t Tanakh of the Torah. The Tanakh. says, Yeah. Um, but he was wounded. What's going on over there? Don't worry, we, we can't see anyway. So yeah. Because he was wounded because of our transgressions. Now who was wounded? Well, according to the text, according to the Talgum, what, what, what do you want? Who was wounded? Israel or the Messiah? Well, obviously the people of Israel were wounded. So, okay. Now, the reason why I ask you that, because if we go to Ruth Rabbah, ah. it says the Messiah and he will eat in the world to come. The fifth explanation for come here is King Messiah. Come here that is drawn near to kingship and eat from the bread that is the bread of kingship and dip your morsel in the vinegar this is the chastisement as it is said but he was wounded for our transgressions isaiah 53. so this is clearly they've seen it as a messianic verse because you've put it's israel but here they're saying uh, in this in the book of ruth whatever this verse is ref what happened in the book of ruth is a reference or symbolism of king messiah who was wounded because of our transgression so when Christians say Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah and not about Israel and we're appealing to someone who was taught according to you by three prophets this is why I say the later rabbis came okay well they're checking everybody out. okay can we just continue okay yeah just go back to 10-15 minutes can I ask you sure okay you see the first command command yeah what yeah. is it no, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. Does that go for both of you? I'm the yes. Lord. So, but you believe in one God. Yeah. But you believe in three and one. God. Next time he's here, yeah. we'll have that conversation. Yeah. Come and listen to yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. Do you believe in one God? Yeah. It will take too long to go into. If you're here next time, you follow the first command. I believe absolutely. He believes composite. So you believe? Yes. So you believe in the first commandment? Yes, you do. If you're here next week, we'll have that discussion. The author of the first commandment. Oh, it's got. It's got a little bit to finish. Off, that's why. Yes. Because I just want to wrap up this bit on the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Let's go. But we have to go out though, yeah. boys. You should, go, you should go to church. You need church. You need church. LB left the building. Elvis left the building. Right, let me. Just, just to conclude, so we conclude it. Like, right, we'll deal with Ruth Rabba next time, and we'll just uh, we'll oh. plug now. So we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll wrap up. Is it still recording? Oh, all right, cool. is that, you yeah. all right with that? We'll or, deal with Ruth. Well, we'll deal with Ruth Rabba next time. Yeah, or do you want to conclude with that? So I have to look. I will have to look into the medrash there. Okay. But so medrash is a very fine art. Okay. So. So basically, I just repeat and we'll wrap up shortly because the park is closing. So basically what I did, I brought up the Targum and Jonathan Ben Uzel, who said that the Isaiah 53 was about uh, the Messiah. Then we had Josh who said it was about the nation of Israel because that's what now the later rabbi rabbinic consensus is. But my argument has always been when you look at a lot of the text, we see concepts that, um, that Christians come up with buried within Judaism's very own text. So that's why when he said, well, it seems strange that apparently if someone's taught by the prophets, they've got it completely wrong by some of the rabbis who were never taught by any of the prophets. Then I went to Ruth Rabba, which also reflects on Isaiah 53 to confirm that this is a passage about the Messiah being wounded. Now, even when I spoke to you before, you said 
every interpretation is correct. When you go, to, so that means this verse is about the Messiah, and somehow it's also about Israel too, because if both are, one can't be incorrect. So, according to your own logic, this you therefore have to accept this. Learning medrash is a very fine art. Yeah. We're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna delve into the Ruth Rabba okay. next time. Okay, right. next time we're gonna analyze it. We're gonna see how you've misunderstood okay. what Ruth Rabba is actually doing, okay. because there's a certain method that medrash uses. That's for next time. All right? okay. When it comes to the Talgum, I'd like to say this. The Talgum draws, and I've said this before, a very clear distinction between the servant and the sufferer. And throughout the Talgum, it is very clear that the servant is the Messiah, whilst the sufferer is the house of Israel. Well, and just on one last note. Who and is also, it's very, it's very possible that the speaker from, the, from verse 1 onwards may actually be the kings of the nations if you follow it on from what he said in, in the, the last verse of chapter 52. That's also very possible. Okay, and so... should not be disregarded. So on that note, we shall conclude. We'll continue with the messia messianic verses and who the Messiah was next time um, because there's probably plenty of more that I can go into. Of course. So in conclusion, I just want to say that the reason why, again, I started with Islam was looking at some of the stories and they said and asked whether Muhammad could be a true prophet and looking at some of the inconsistencies within Islamic texts and the Quran with Jew Jewish history and thought and understanding. Then when we've jumped to the concept of the Messiah, I've been able to base an argument based on things that we can pull from Jewish sources itself. Even though there may be some disagreements within understanding certain passages, we also see a certain common link between some Christian thought and things that are within Jewish text. So it's not that Christians are inventing interpretations of some verses. There are some verses we may disagree with totally. But again, one of the core proof texts that Christian uses is Isaiah 53. And I've clearly demonstrated that one of the earliest rabbis who apparently was taught by three prophets understood this verse to be a messianic verse and we also go I proof text it with something else that also said the messiah was pierced and wounded for our transgression so christians jews cannot complain that christians are making things up out of the air because we've actually shown things from within their text and as jewish um, as Josh said in our last conversation that every opinion has to be correct. They, they, even if they appear contradictory in some metaphysical way, they are all correct. So therefore, the Christians are, according to Josh, in some way also correct. Perfect. So if you would like to have the final thank word. You, oh, thank you. Um, uh, Josh. Okay, so well, Peyton nice. Boy, of course, started talking about um, my conversation with Ali Dawa and talking about Muslims. And uh, whilst that was an interesting conversation, it's really much more com much more interesting when you talk to Muslims themselves instead of just talking about it behind their backs. It doesn't really do much in terms of getting anything out of the discussion. And as for um, Paperboy's unique arguments, which of course have been started really by people like Michael Brown um, over the last few decades. Um, these new arguments where they try to find places in rabbinic texts, like the Talmud, like the Medrash, like the Talgum, um, and uh, try to fit it in with what they have to say, is uh, that they, uh, it, it's a credit to them that they've that they're starting to make new arguments, but uh, as I've shown with already the Targum and with the um, with 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 one Gemara already, this is not really the true understanding of the Rabbinic texts. The Rabbinic texts need to be understood in the in the way that they intended to be understood, not in the way that you want them to be understood. Um, as for the Medrash and the Ruth Rambo, we're going to deal with, hope, with that hopefully next time, um, God willing. Um, but until then. Um, thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Until Josh. Next time.